But if you want to take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 96, turn to the 96th Psalm. As you all know, Missions Conference is vastly approaching, and I believe it would do us well to begin tuning our hearts and focusing our attention and directing our outlook towards this grand and glorious call to evangelism, to spreading the gospel. And so I want to preach this morning a message that hopefully will kind of set the stage for how we as the Lord's people are to look towards the Great Commission and the call to evangelize. I want to preach on the guaranteed success of the Great Commission. I also want to say, by way of introduction, and, and express again and again my thanks to New Testament Baptist Church, my appreciation for this body. Uh, what a tremendous opportunity it has been for Abigail and myself to be sent out of this church, to be uh, authorized by New Testament to do the work that we're doing in Paris, Tennessee. Uh, I am so grateful to know that there's a body of believers here in Stewart County that has a heart for other people, whether they be in Ukraine or South America or Mexico or even just a county over in Henry County. And I hope you're encouraged to know that the Lord is using you to do this great work. Does the Lord use large churches? Yes. Does the Lord use big associations? Yes. Does he use organizations? Yes. But he also uses small Amen. local churches. Amen. Chiefly, I would say, he uses local churches. And he uses small local churches to fulfill his work. So, turn to Psalm 96. And I'll begin reading there in verse number 1. Psalm 96, verse 1. These are the words of God. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord. Bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering. And come into his courts. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful. And all that is therein, then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, and he shall judge the, the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Now it's obvious from a cursory reading that this psalm is one of praise. As all people throughout all the earth are repeatedly besought to worship the Lord. However, this psalm is also a great missional psalm. As this psalm pictures for us the guaranteed fulfillment of the Great Commission. In this psalm, we see the latter day glories of the church as the Gentile nations stream into it. And as the gospel prospers, not just amongst the Jews, but against every kindred and every tribe. Perhaps the core message of this psalm is this central thrust that deals with something even a bit deeper than missions. You understand that 
Missions is not the great end of the church. Worship is the great end of the church. Missions is how we achieve that end. What do we want from the world? What do we want the world to do? What are we as the Lord's people uh, beseeching others to enter into? The worship of the Lord. And how do we do that? Through missions. And here in Psalm 96, we find the exhortation to evangelize, and we see the fruit of our missional endeavors as the people of the earth throng to worship Jehovah God. But beyond that, we see something perhaps even more foundational and preliminary as this psalm puts forth the motivation for evangelism and the basis of worship. So the goal is worship. The means to reach that goal is missions, but why? What's the purpose of this worship? Motives are very important in the Christian life. God not only cares about what we do, but He cares about why we do it. That which drives us, that which ignites us, that which moves us, that which encourages us, matters to God. Pure motives propel us in the right direction, where perverse motives always lead us down a wrong path. Therefore, it is of the utmost importance that we know why we do the things that we do, and that we always stay true to righteous motivation. And for the Christian, there is one motive that is always to be above all others. Other motives are beneath and subsidiary to this one supreme motive. Nothing should set our hearts ablaze. Nothing should grind our, our gears. Nothing should get our wheels spinning like this one motive. This master motive, the motive for our evangelism, the basis for our worship, is the glory of God. The glory of God. Paul said in the epistles, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Moses there in the Old Testament, what he needed to propel him in the mission that God had called him to do, what he needed most for his personal life, for his endeavors in serving the Lord, was to see God's glory. He said, Lord, show me your glory. Show me your glory. And the glory of God must be what our hearts desire more than anything else. This is what must drive us if we are to really do a work for the Lord. If we are driven by the praise of men, we will burn out. If we are motivated by worldly possessions, we will be overcome with discouragement. If our desire is a selfish longing for some kind of emotional experience, our hearts will never be satisfied. If our goal is simply numbers and statistics, we'll never meet those goals. Only the glory of God can sustain the servants of God throughout whatever work they're called to do. It must be the glory of God that drives us. It must be the glory of God that inspires us. It must be the glory of God that pushes us to serve Him. I was listening to a missionary who had, he has a ministry where he goes to South America and he trains locals to pastor churches. And he trains Americans to go to South America and minister in the country of Peru. And he was saying that Oftentimes he will ask prospective missionaries. He will say, have you ever had an entire night where you could not sleep? You could not get any rest because you were burdened for the loss of a particular country. And he said oftentimes those prospective missionaries would say, yes, I've experienced that. I've thought about all of those people uh, that are lost, that are in their sin, that are dying, that are going to hell, and, I, and it's kept me up at night. And he says, well, I'm, I'm going to ask you something that's an even greater motivating factor. 
Say what? Could there be something that motivates us even greater than knowing that there are lost people that are dying and going to hell? He says, yes, there is something that should motivate you even more than that. He said, have you ever been up with no sleep, with no rest, because you were in agony, knowing that there was a place on earth where Christ was not exalted and God was not glorified? So that should motivate you even more than knowing that there are lost people in that country. What's an even greater motivator? It's not just to go there so that the lost can be saved, but to go there so that God can be glorified. Yeah. So I want to ask us, New Testament Baptist Church, as we prepare for this missions conference next month, and as we think about supporting missions, and as we think about doing missions, is this our chief motivator? Is it the glory of God? Is that why we're doing it? The glory of God is the high-octane fuel in the gas tank of our evangelism. And the greater our passion is for the glory of God, the greater our zeal will be for souls to come unto Christ. The higher our view of God, the more glorious we see Jehovah, the greater desire we will have for Him to be praised by all of creation. We must have the glory of God as our chief motive. Now from Psalm 96, I want you to see several things along these lines. The first is this, the call to worship. The call to worship. Beginning in verse number 1, the psalmist says this, Sing unto the Lord a new song. The call to worship begins with an exhortation to sing. God is pleased when men and women unite their voice to praise Him in song, so much so that He mandates congregational singing as a required element of our worship. He's speaking to all the people. He's not, he's not commanding specials here in this verse. No, He's saying all of the redeemed have a responsibility to join together and to sing unto the Lord. Now this new song here, what, what is he talking about? This new song refers to a song of redemption. This is a song that is not like the ones that the natural man sings who is dead in his trespasses and sins. It is a song that can only be sung by those who have experienced the redemptive grace of God and have encountered His glory. Notice that this call is absolutely indiscriminate and universal. Sing unto the, unto the Lord all the earth. Throughout this psalm, we, we will see uh, several universal addresses such as that. All the people, all the earth. The praise was to go forth from Israel, but it was not to end there. It was to go forth and it was to spread like yeast spreads throughout a loaf of bread until it encompassed the whole earth. No corner of the earth is to be silent. No race is to be quiet. No ethnicity, no culture is to be dumb or lame before the Lord. But all people are come and worship Him. And we are simply to be that which the Lord uses to kick off this praise. Our, our worship should not stay within these four walls. Our worship should begin here. Like you would start a fire. You get that ember going. You get that coal burning. And then once you get that coal burning, you can put dry wood on top of it, and that wood will be set ablaze. That is how the Lord's church is supposed to be. We must keep the embers hot here. That is why we meet Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, we meet to think about the Lord, to study the Lord, to focus our hearts upon the Lord, to keep those embers hot. And then when the Lord gives us opportunity to go out of these four walls and to go to Paris, Tennessee, or to go to Guyana, or to go to the Ukraine, or to go to wherever the Lord gives us opportunity to go, we are to take the heat of those embers and we are to place the dry wood of wherever we're going on top of those embers and we're to trust the Lord 
to make the combustion of his worship a reality wherever he leads us. All of the earth Jehovah made, and all of the earth must sing to him. Notice it doesn't say, all the earth, if you feel like it, sing unto the Lord. Worshiping God is a command. Worshiping God is an indicative. Worshiping God is not optional. All people, every nation, every church, every family, even the unregenerate, even the lost, are commanded to worship the Lord. Now, they can't worship the Lord. And so they, they, they don't obey this command. Yet they too are commanded. Right. All of you are commanded to worship the Lord. It begins in the heart, begins in your affections, begins in the desires of your soul, but it manifests itself outwardly in obedience, in service, in prayer, in thanksgiving, and yes, in song. We see... He repeats it again in verse 2. Sing unto the Lord. Hebrew literature, to stress emphasis upon a particular phrase, will repeat it. And this has now been repeated to the, third to the third degree, the third time. We sing unto the Lord. All the earth is to sing. And our aim in singing is to bless His name. The name of God. We see in verse 2. Bless His name. The name of God is the sum and substance of who he is. God said, because I could swear by no greater, I swore by my own name. The character, the nature, the essence of God is all wrapped up in his name. There's power in the name of God. That's why our prayers are to be in Jesus' name. That's why when we gather together, we're gathering in Jesus' name for worship. Jesus says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Jesus honors himself. He honors the divine name. Now, say we all decide on a Tuesday afternoon to, to go grab a fellowship meal. Now, we're all meeting together, but we're not there necessarily in Jesus' name for the purpose of worship. Jesus is present with us because he's omnipresent and he dwells his people through his spirit. But there is a special sense in which Jesus is present when his people are gathered together to worship him, to worship the Father, to worship the Spirit in a way that he's not present anywhere else. Bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. How do we show forth the salvation of the Lord by worshiping Him as saved people, gathering together, observing the ordinances, preaching the gospel, proclaiming the goodness of the Lord. And we do these things from day to day. We are to be constantly manifesting and showing forth the spiritual salvation the Lord has wrought within us. For the Christian worshiping the Lord through his prescribed means, is like breathing air. It should be a basic and fundamental function of our lives. Yet without it, we would have no life. You understand that? You don't have to conscientiously decide to breathe. Yet it is the most essential thing that you will ever do. If you stop doing it, you will cease to live. Well, worshiping the Lord is a conscientious decision. But yet it should also be something that just comes naturally to you. In other words, Sunday morning, yes, you hear, hear what I'm saying. Yes, you should prepare your heart. And, and yes, you should, you should ensure that you are coming before him worthily. But you should not have to turn on some kind of act to come to church to worship God. Uh, yeah. You should not have to put on some kind of, some kind of face between 11 and 12 so that you can come to church around all your church folks and worship God and then you can go home and then just be yourself. No, you, you should have this fundamental 
principle within you of worshiping God always and rejoicing in the goodness of God from day to day so that your corporate gathering is just an overflow of what you do in private and then your what you do in private will be an overflow of the corporate gathering. We're showing forth his salvation from day to day. We must have all of Christ for all of life if we are to worship all of God all the time. We cannot compartmentalize our life and break it down into, well, this is how I think and act when I'm at work, and this is how I think and act when I'm around my buddies, and this is how I think and act at church. Because if we do that, how we think and act at church will not be accepted by God because it's hypocrisy. Right. And you know who sees right through that? More so than other Christians. Most people. They see right through it. The reason, here's the reason why you don't see it. The reason why you don't see why someone is being hypocritical in church is because you're doing the same thing. And so you don't see it. Because just like they do, they have their little church performance that they put on. You do as well. You don't see it. But lost people do. We got to give them credit where credit's due. At least they're heathens all the time. At least they're consistent. They have wicked, evil, and sinful desires, and they boast about their wicked, evil, and sinful desires. And they're very open about their pursuit of ungodliness. They're very open about the fact that they don't care if God is glorified. They want to glorify themselves, and they will tell you that. But you, on the other hand, you have evil, wicked, and sinful desires, but you try to hide it away from the church folks, and when you come to church, you try to pretend as if you don't have those desires. We need to search our hearts. Because again, what should motivate us in missions what should motivate us to serve God, to fulfill His command of going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature. It's not that we might be praised. It's not that people might look upon us and say, well, look what that church is doing. You've, you've heard those conversations. Churches, and I think it's a good thing to some extent, churches that, that just have a reputation as being very mission-minded. And by the way, New Testament is one of those churches that just has a reputation for being very mission-minded. How many missions conferences are there, number one, that are really and truly dedicated to the subject of missions? But I don't know of very many that preach all missionaries, that have a focus on unreached people groups, that have an emphasis on doing local church missions. But still, that's not our goal. Our goal is not so that we can be considered as a mission-minded church by other churches. Our goal in missions should be the glory of God alone. So he says in verse 3, Declare his glory among the heathen. How are the heathen supposed to sing the praise of the glory of God? How are the heathen supposed to perceive the goodness of God? You're supposed to tell them about it. How else will they know? Uh, we get we get into these uh, these mindsets where we we just like to complain about the world. Mm -hmm. Oh, such and such is doing this. Such and such is doing that. Well, here's the thing. How do we expect lost people to act? We should not be surprised when lost people act like lost people. And so when you're complaining about the co-worker that's cussing like a sailor, or you're complaining about the guy you ran into at the grocery store that was uh, dealing dishonestly, before you complain about him, you should ask him, you should ask yourself, well, this guy is acting that way because he doesn't know anything about the Lord or what the Lord has said, so why are you complaining about him when you didn't try to tell him about who the Lord was? I know that's very convicting for us to think about. When we see other countries, when we see our own country chasing after evil, 
pursuing ungodliness and we want to complain about the Democrats in Congress, well, we shouldn't be surprised when the Democrats or the Republicans deal in wickedness because they don't know the Lord. And no amount of legislation, no outcome of any election will change that. The only thing that will change that is if God sends someone to tell them about the Lord and the goodness of God and the glory of God. The glory of God. What, what is it? It's the visible manifestation of the attributes of God. Why, why, do, why do we not tell lies? Because God is truth. That's the glory of God. Why do we abstain from sexual immorality? Because God is pure, and that's the glory of God when we see the manifestation of His attributes. Why do we not steal? Because God is just. God provides. And we want to manifest His glory, therefore we want to conform to who He is and His image. There's no better way to declare the glory of God than to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because nowhere were the attributes of God more fully displayed than in the gospel. Holy love, wrath, justice, mercy, grace, sovereignty was all in the cross. Even God's power of Creation and recreation was seen in the cross because it is the cross that causes the recreation of the those who are lost and dead in trespasses and sins. How does God regenerate? How does God create new life within them through the power of the cross? And the psalm tells us that if we are to declare his glory among the heathen, if we are to declare his wonders among all people, as it says in verse 3, we must be worshiping the Lord ourselves. We must be visibly displaying the attributes of God in our daily conversation. We must be preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must be proclaiming his goodness. And we must trust that the work that God has called us to do it's not a vain proposition, but it is a promise that will be fulfilled. The gospel message shall be published and proclaimed until it is received by the heathen nations. This song shall be fulfilled, for God will receive the worship that he is owed. You understand that? Now what a sublime motivation to evangelize that is. That everyone who is supposed to worship God will worship Him. Every knee will bow to Him. Every tongue will profess to Him. Everyone will believe the gospel in, in some sense. I'm not preaching universalism. I'm not saying that all will be saved. But what I'm saying is, is that there will be no one who will scoff at the name of Jesus. There will be no one who will mock the name of God. God will not be mocked. There will be no one who will not recognize He is the King of glory. He is the sovereign of the universe. He is the God of the cosmos. And I will bow to Him. So, if we shrink back when the world does not receive our message, the problem is not that they don't believe it. The problem is that we don't believe it. And if we preach the gospel and we don't have any reception, we don't have any response, and we think, well, I guess the problem is with me. I, I, what you're really doing is you're limiting the power of God to save his people. When, when the gospel is rejected, that should only motivate us to keep preaching it and to keep preaching it because it is only a matter of time before God will conquer the hearts of the unbelievers by His efficacious grace or He will smite them with His holy wrath. But the gospel will be victorious. The gospel will accomplish everything that it is to accomplish. This is our call to worship. And what a privilege it is for mortal men 
and mortal women to be invited to praise the glorious triune God. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. But now I want to show you the cause for worship. In this text, beginning at verse 4, going to the end of the psalm, we see five causes for our worship. Now there are many reasons to worship the Lord. There are innumerable reasons to worship the Lord. But the psalm highlights five. Understand that God is worthy of our worship simply because of who He is. But yet, because He knows and He understands how our minds work as humans, He gives us these very obvious and explicit reasons to offer our praise unto Him. We worship God Verse 4, because he is great and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. Understand this, nothing in our worship of God should be little. We are called to praise him with a largeness of heart. The worship of God should really dominate your life. You should organize everything else in your life around the worship of God. We worship God because he is great and greatly to be praised. What is the chief end of man? To glorify or to worship God and enjoy him forever. That's not the chief end of your weekend. It's not the chief end of your Sunday. That's the chief end of who you are and why you were made. You were not made to work. You were not made to get married. You were not made to have children. You're not made to have a career. Now, are you supposed to do all of these things? Yes. But ultimately, you were made to worship and glorify God forever. And all of those other things should be a part of that ultimate means. Should you get married? Yes, but only if that marriage will help you to glorify and worship God. Should you have a career? Yes, but only if that career will help you to worship and glorify God. On and on we could go. Now these five reasons. Number one, we worship God because of creation. Our God should be praised because our God created the heavens. Look at verse number five. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. God is the one who has made us and not we ourselves. And we need to preach that from the rooftops in this secularized, self-centered, man-exalting day that we live in. You were not made by yourself. You did not just come from a blip in the universe. God made you. He owns you by rights of creation, and you are called to worship Him. He alone has creative rights over all that was made, and anything that seeks to occupy his place as creator is an idol. An idol is a non-entity. An idol is a, is a nothing. The, the gods of the nations are, are zeros. They are wannabe gods. That they have no existence. But our God is the father of existences. And everything that exists does so because he gave it its existence. In a sense, even these idols only exist because God created them. So why would God create idols? To manifest his superiority over the false gods that men can devise. Created for one end, to be utterly cast down and utterly destroyed. Our God is so great that other gods cannot even create themselves to oppose him. He has to create them for them. Mm -hmm. Our God is so great that to manifest his superiority, because nothing else on its own could challenge who he is, he has to give it the ability to do so. And we have deaf, dumb, blind idols in our country today that sometimes they don't appear 
to be gods. They don't necessarily even explicitly claim to be gods, but that's just what they are. The foolish idol of Darwinism that conquers academia in America, that, that has produced the theory of evolution, what, what is that? It's a, an entity, a non-entity, that seeks to challenge who God says he is and what God has said he has done. And the only people more mistaken than Charles Darwin himself are Christians who think there can be an accommodation made between Darwinism and Christianity. There's no compatibility between Genesis and Darwin. Christians who believe their Bibles, Christians who, who fear God, shun the idol gods, and they confess alone that the God of the Scriptures is the Creator, and they praise Him for it. We praise God for creation. Secondly, we praise God because of His character. In verse 6, honor and majesty are before Him. They are originating with Him. They flow from Him. Honor and majesty are those attributes which constitute His presence. Wherever God is, there is always going to be honor and majesty. Even when God is in a burning bush, there is honor. Don't come closer, Moses. Take your shoes off your feet. Honor me. Strength and beauty are in this sanctuary. And these speak of attributes which are especially comforting to his people who worship within his sanctuary. The sanctuary of God simply the house of God. In the Old Testament, it was the tabernacle and the temple. But what is the sanctuary of God in the New Testament? It's the New Testament church. We call the, the room the sanctuary, but really and truly, this is just an auditorium. We are the sanctuary. And wherever we gather to worship God, there is strength and there is beauty. Isn't that a mighty thing? There's no such thing as a, a weak, defeated, and anemic church. At least there shouldn't be. Because there's strength and beauty here. Sin and corruption and ugliness, spiritual ugliness, has no place here. Because there's beauty here where the Lord is worshipped. And this is the character of our God, how it's communicated to us. Thirdly, we worship God because of conscription. What do I mean by that? Simply that God conscribes us to worship Him. Look at verse 7. Give unto the Lord. That word give, same word as the word ascribe. It is beckoning us to attribute something to God. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Much like the exhortation to sing, we see this conscription to give repeated three times. Now this is, of course, what we would call ascribed glory. When we talk about the glory of God, you must make this, this theological distinction, if you will. There are two types of glory. There is the intrinsic glory of God. That is just who God is. That glory will never be added to. That glory will never be diminished. God relies upon no one for that glory. That's who he is. It's his intrinsic glory. It is, it is essential to God. But when we're commanded to give glory to God or to glorify God, now we're talking about in uh, ascribe glory. It is the glory not that, that defines who he is, but it is the glory that we repeat back to him. We see his intrinsic glory, and then we say, Lord, you are glorious. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. It doesn't affect whether or not his name is glorious. It will be glorious whether you recognize it or not. But you are commanded to recognize it and to confess that back to him. Now, why does God want us to do this? Do you think God doesn't know that he's glorious? No, God knows that he's glorious. So why does he command us to tell him, Lord, you're glorious? Well, it's not so that he will know. It's so that we will know. Why are we commanded to pray? 
Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Does God not know where he is? God knows he's in heaven. God knows that his name is holy. Why are we commanded to pray that way? Not for God's benefit, but for our benefit. So even this command to worship God, you see, is a gracious command. And we should not look at it like, oh, I've got to go to church. Oh, I've got to sing. We, we shouldn't look at it as, I, I have to preach. I have this obligation to preach. We should say, I'm privileged to worship God in the preaching of His Word, in the singing of the psalms, in the singing of the hymns, in the prayers of the saints. God has commanded this, but He's commanded it for my good. The same way that a, a mother would command her child to eat certain foods that she knows will be beneficial to the child's health. The child does not necessarily want to do it all the time, but they know that the mother knows that it's not for her benefit. The mother will go on living whether you eat that broccoli or not. But you cannot live without food, without sustenance. And we as God's people cannot live without worshiping Him. And any Christian that can be content and satisfied without giving God the glory due unto His name is not a Christian. It is essential to who we are as God's people. We have this longing to worship God that only worship in spirit and truth to the true God can fulfill. So even this beckoning to give Him glory is something God does for our good. You want an example of this? Look at Nebuchadnezzar. What did Nebuchadnezzar say? Is this not great Babylon that I have built? For the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? That's what Nebuchadnezzar said. He did not worship God. And what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? He fell into an abyss of insanity and depravity. Your continuance as a human being depends upon your worship of God. You will literally go insane if you do not worship Him. Because He's the sustainer of all things. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before Him all the earth. When we're ascribing glory to God, we're paying homage to one who is infinitely superior to who we are. Therefore, when we enter into his presence, we do so in his terms, not ours. We are to be dressed in the garments of purity and holiness and godliness. And these are not physical clothes. We're to worship him in the beauty of holiness. This is the adorning of the heart in righteousness without hypocrisy and without duplicity. Where does that begin? It begins with having our motive as the glory of God. I heard a story of a man who said that his family was originally from one of the Eastern European countries. And they were Greek Orthodox, or Eastern Orthodox. And then, when they moved over into Prussia, they converted to Judaism. And he asked his father, why did we convert from Greek Orthodox to Judaism? And his father told him, well, son, I'm in the insurance business and to be in the insurance business, you have to have friends to sell insurance to. Well, back east, all of my friends were Greek Orthodox, so I went to the Greek Orthodox Church because that was good for business. But now that we're over a little bit into Western Europe, uh, all of our friends are, are Jews. So we're in uh, a Judaic church now, going to temple, because that's what's good for business. And that young man, who at the time was a teenager, he said he learned then that religion... Christless religion is just a tool used to manipulate and control and group socially. That young man was Vladimir Lenin. And what did Vladimir Lenin do? 
Vladimir Lenin established the Russian Orthodox Church, which became a tool of control and manipulation in the Soviet Union. Why am I telling you this? Because that is what happens when we form our religion around any other motive than the motive of God's glory. If we seek to build our empires, they will be empires of dirt. They will crumble, they will be destroyed, because God will be glorified. We worship Him because of this conscription. And let us be thankful that God has conscripted us to praise Him. God has commanded us to glorify Him. And let us obey His command and give Him the glory that is due unto His name. The best thing you could ever do is to obey this command to worship God. Fourthly, we worship God because of His conquering. Look at verse 10. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Our God should be praised because our God reigns. All of our reasons to praise God kind of climax and crescendo with this great cause. We worship God because Christ has assumed the throne and His kingdom is forever and the increase of His kingdom shall never end. Not only is this a cause for our worship, but it is also the central theme of our evangelism. We don't go out into the world and proclaim a weak and needy and sissified and pacified and, and still being crucified Jesus that needs you to fulfill him. Who do we proclaim? We proclaim the King of Kings. We proclaim the Lord of Lords. We proclaim the mighty conqueror of the nations who is coming. And when he comes again, he will come in judgment. Judging by the own words of his mouth that come forth like a sharp two-edged sword. And this proclamation is to be taken to the ends of the earth. Why should the heathen believe the gospel? Why, why should a sinner come to Christ? That's not simply so that your life can get back on track, so that you can overcome your ailments. No, you, you must believe in Christ because the Lord reigned. The Lord reigned. Come see the cross where love and mercy meet as the Son of God is stricken. And see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet. For the conqueror is risen. This grand truth is what prompts mankind to give the worship commandment in verses 7 and 9. Because anyone who truly understands that the Lord reigneth will worship Him, and those that don't worship Him don't grasp the depths of His reign. You're, you're not fit to join the kingdom unless you know who the king is. And unless you bow down and worship at His feet. That's the gospel that we're to proclaim. That, 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 is, that is not something that is to be learned later on in the Christian life. It is not give mental assent now and then obey later. True salvation is always accompanied with heartfelt obedience. And we are to proclaim the exhaustive and absolute reign of God over the heathen, over the earth, over his own people, as we beseech them in Christ's stead to come unto him. We proclaim the sovereignty of God over creation, that God has made everything, that God reigns over everything. We proclaim the sovereignty of God over salvation, that Jesus is the one who made the atonement, and that Christ is the one who has died and risen again, and that he has procured the crown rights of redemption, and in his sovereignty he dispenses them to whomsoever he wishes, and that he reigns in salvation by a distinguishing grace. We proclaim that it is the Father who has chosen a people for his Son from among the nations, and that the Son has come to definitely redeem this vast multitude from their sin. And then we proclaim that because of this, what you must do is not perform some vain work, not pray some silly prayer. 
She must bow and receive what the king bestows upon his people. This is not to take a back seat in our missionary endeavors. This glorious and unbridled gospel is what we are to declare to the heathen. And what an encouragement the Lord's reign is in our evangelism. The fruits of gospel preaching are not based on our ability or our eloquence, but on the power and might of God. And what a comfort that is to a helpless sinner who does not know God. They can flee to him. They can come to him knowing that he has all power and has made full provision for their salvation. His reign extends when he says that the world also shall be established. Do you realize that if God would but remove his staying hand for even a moment, the whole earth would crumble. It is God that keeps this world spinning on its axis. It is God that keeps this world continuing by the natural laws that we so trust in. And the God who reigns, the God who upholds, the God who sustains the world is not some petty, despotic tyrant sitting upon a throne. No, it is a loving, caring, compassionate God who reigns. Oftentimes when we think of a king, we think of a harsh and bitter and cruel ruler. That's what Hollywood usually portrays kings as being. But that is not who our king is. Our king is one who loves his people. Our king is one who desires his people to worship before him. Lastly, we praise God because of his coming. When we, when we think about missionary endeavors, when we think about fulfilling the Great Commission, when we think about doing the work that God has given for us to do, we should always remember that the climax, the conclusion of missions is the second coming of Christ. Because missions will go on until he comes again. And so the psalm says in verse 12, Let the field be joyful, and all that is therein. And then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord, for he cometh, he cometh. This, this should be the sum substance of what we proclaim in our evangelism. The Lord reigneth, and the Lord cometh. The Lord reigneth, and the Lord cometh. And you must bow to this reign, so that when he cometh, you're standing on the right side of the throne. What is he going to do when he cometh? For he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness, and the people with is truth. The final impetus for our worship is the truth of God's righteous judgment over the whole world. There's coming a day when all of the defilement, all of the corruption that is wrought by sin will be wiped away. Everything will be done righteously. Everything will be done in truth. Everything will be executed in holiness. And this coming day is not to be characterized by fear and terror. Again, oftentimes when we think of the second coming, we think of this cataclysmic and awful and scary event. But if you know Christ, it's not an event that should cause you to fear. It's an event that should cause you to rejoice. You should long to see him. You should long for the day when he shall come again, having put all enemies under his feet, and at his coming the last enemy, which is death itself, shall be likewise destroyed. In the Baptist Catechism, there's a question, and it, it, it asks essentially, what is in store for the Christian on the final day when Christ returns? And the answer is something along the lines of, Christ's people will be publicly vindicated by God on the last day. Yeah. Sure, you might, by not serving the Lord now, you might gain some temporary improvement of the world. You might gain some temporary acceptance in society. Uh, you might gain the praise of some unbelievers that will last for a little while. But by serving the Lord now, 
Though you're mocked, though you're accursed, though you're despised by men, there's coming a day in which Christ himself, when he judges the earth in righteousness, he will call each one of you individually and he will go through the entirety of your life and he will vindicate your service of him. And the, the whole world of unbelievers will see where you served him and how you served him and how he was pleased with that service. We don't know what your motives are now. I, you don't know what my motives are now. But on that last day, our motives will be revealed. Is the glory of God your motive for serving Him? This is the God that we are to proclaim. These are the reasons why we are to worship Him as we declare the truth of God, as we declare His gospel, and as we worship Him because we are driven and enthralled and passionate for His glory. Others are to then come and to see that passion for the glory of God and to enter into the worship that ensues. And the glory of God is nowhere seen more than in the person of His Son. So I ask you, is, is the glory of God your motive? And does that motivate you to tell others about God so that they too can enter into worship of this God who has sent his son to die on the cross of Calvary? This God who reigns and this God who is coming again. As missions conference approaches, I pray that we all would consider these things and that we would prepare our hearts individually and corporately, that we would beg the Lord to continue to use us, to continue to manifest His self amongst us, and to continue to exalt Christ through us, in us, and in the world. Let us pray. Father, we thank You. In Jesus' name, we ask that You would glorify Yourself, glorify the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, May he be exalted. May he be lifted up. May we have as our chief motive God's ultimate glory for all that we do as your people. And may that motive be fulfilled when God comes again, when Christ comes again in unveiled glory. Lord, we love you because you have first loved us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.